It's on? Okay, gotcha. Oh, good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Sorry, I'm sorry. I just got here. Traffic's been fun, as usual. Um, I, I, my, my name is Donna Fury. I'm the sponsor and the moderator for today. Thank you for coming. It's, it's nice to see everybody, and we really appreciate that everybody come. And uh, you're going to have a really great um, CLE tonight. And I think it's going to be interesting, and hopefully everybody will learn a lot. And we're lucky to have John Daly to be our speaker tonight. Uh, John has, ha has his own practice, da Daly and Marino. He's been having his practice for 17 years. Um, he, uh, he focuses his uh, practice on elder abuse and nursing home negligence matters. And uh, he has tried cases concerning the failure of nursing homes, assisted living facilities, hospitals, uh, to provident resident care consistent with state and federal regulations. So he really, uh, he's got some big cases right now that I think you're going to hear about in the news. Um, if you haven't already, they'll come to mind. Uh, he handles, you know, plenty of cases for elderly residents of nursing homes who suffer injuries from falls, you know, pressure ulcers, dehydration, medication errors and sexual abuse. I mean, all of the things that you've been hearing about in the news lately. Uh, you know, many of you are elder law practitioners, and so many of these things you see every single day in your practice. Uh, you hear about it. You know, uh, you see families abusing their, you know, the caregivers abusing. So uh, I think that this is going to be really relevant, and I think it's going to be great. And without further ado, here's John. Okay. Thank you, Donna. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, hey, my name is John Daly. I'm uh, very proud to be here. I've been a member of the Queens County Bar Association for quite some time, and I'm always happy uh, to come back and speak to our members. And uh, Donna is correct. Uh, I think the timing of this uh, CLE is very, very good. Uh, if you've been reading the papers and paying attention to what's been going on uh, at nursing homes uh, within the past year, we've had a lot of media coverage about really horrible incidents of, of neglect and abuse at nursing homes uh, throughout the state. Uh, many of you may, may have heard about the uh, Medford incident, the nursing home out in Medford, Long Island, uh, where the Attorney General uh, indicted uh, not only administrators at the nursing home, but uh, caregivers, which is really unprecedented. And I think what's happening in this area uh, uh, of the law is that the governmental officials, attorney generals, district attorneys are starting to pay attention to some of the abuses that are uh, going on uh, at these facilities and looking to prosecute those who are responsible for hurting who, uh, people who really are the most vulnerable in our society, which are our elderly. And uh, I've given this uh, a, a similar seminars on nursing home negligence, nursing home abuse over the last several years. Uh, tonight, I'm actually going to mix it up a little bit. Instead of starting uh, or talking about nursing homes, and we will talk about nursing homes, I want to start with another area that's come to the forefront in the past, I'd say, year or so. And that is neglect and abuse at the hands of home health care aides. And this is something that has been going on for quite a while, and we're going to touch on a number of the reasons why this is happening. Uh, but suffice it to say, the home health care industry, and when I say home health care, I'm talking about companies that hire individuals to go into the home to provide the elderly with help with activities of daily living bathing, toileting, uh, dressing, shopping, cooking, things of that nature. So these aren't uh, technically health care providers, they're not nurses. Uh, they aren't, uh, they're not RNs, they're not LPNs. They're individuals who are paid by Medicaid to come into the home and help individuals. And just to give a little bit of background, uh, under the old Medicaid system, before we had the changes in 2011, uh, the providers would, would bill Medicaid directly for services that were provided by home health care aid. So the agencies would be paid uh, directly. Uh, and what's happened over the last several years is that the flow of money in Medicaid, uh, the government has changed how they do business. And they have uh, enabled uh, managed Medicaid agencies to spring up. And it's like the old HMO system, 
You know, we used to have insurance where you, you had to go to the doctor, you went to the doctor, and you know, the insurance paid for it. Then there was a shift to HMOs, where if you wanted to see a cardiologist, you had to have your primary care physician give you, give you an authorization or give you a referral. And a similar thing happened uh, with, with Medicaid. So you have these managed Medicaid uh, entities such as GuildNet, such as Horizon, which really function as HMOs. And uh, what they do is they get uh, clients, they get paid a set amount of money per client, like an HMO does. And that was meant to try to stem the, the tide of fraud and, and abuses in the Medicaid system to try to uh, control uh, how much money was being spent. But it caused a much, I think, more significant problem. And that is when you have an agency that's a for-profit entity controlling uh, the money, uh, ultimately, they're going to want to increase their profit. And what's happening is that the toughest cases, those individuals who have the highest level of needs, okay, the elderly who are the most frail, who are, I'll call them the difficult cases, they're being shunned by these agencies. They don't want those cases because it's too expensive for them. And what's happening is those individuals are now getting pushed to nursing homes. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. I just wanted to give you a little bit of, bit of background as to what's happening out there. And this is a problem that's going to increase. Uh, the, uh, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, the population in this country is aging. People are living much longer. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen statistics about how many people are going to be you know, 85 years old in, in 15 years. So it's a problem, and uh, I don't have any answers tonight. And you're going to have questions, particularly those of you who might have loved ones who are um, either uh, need home care or need, uh, you know, need care at all, and you're going to uh, wonder, well, what, what's the solution? And one thing I can tell you is two things for sure. It's a big problem, and I don't have the answer. But um, I, will, I will talk to you a little bit about a case that I think um, – is an eye opener, and it should be an eye opener for, for, for us all. And it's the case of, of Peter Mazza, and this is a case um, that uh, I have filed in, in New York County. And it's a uh, horrible story. Uh, it was a, a 99 year old man whose family, uh, and all of this information is in the material, so I'll, I'll try to cover as much as I can. Uh, 99-year-old man, he had three children, he lived on Staten Island, World War II veteran, uh, worked his whole life, supported his family, paid his taxes. And the only thing he wanted was to be able to die at home. He didn't want to die in a nursing home, he didn't want to die in a hospital. And he made that wish clear to his children, and his children did everything that they could to ensure that he'd be able to live his last days at the home where he spent uh, his life with his wife and kids in Staten Island. And uh, the children, instead of putting the family home in a trust so that they could qualify for Medicaid and inherit the money, they decided that they would take every penny that the man had and spent it and spend it on private care so that he could uh, you know, live at home. But what happened was he outlived his money. And this is, a, again, a problem that uh, a lot of us are going to be facing. And when, he, uh, when the money was gone, they had no choice but to go to the Medicaid system to get help. And the family signed up with a managed, mayor, uh, managed care, Medicaid managed care company that is run by the Visiting uh, Nurse Service of New York and got home aides through a company called Partners in Care, which is a subsidiary, a wholly owned nonprofit of Visiting Nurse Service. Visiting Nurse Service took over this entity uh, a while back. And what you're about to see is going to be a, a, a bit troubling. Um, so I, I warn you in advance. Uh, I'm going to show you two news clips. And uh, I apologize if there's some feedback. We, we want to be able to hear uh, the audio. And I'm going to play two news clips about what happened to this man. 
uh, what these aides did to him, how the family discovered it, and it's going to shock you. If I can get it going here. This is the Mix 11 News at 5. All right, thanks for staying with us on this Wednesday night. I'm Tamsin Fidel. And I'm John Muller. This story is a heartbreaking one. A 99-year-old Staten Island man living out his final months, allegedly at the hands of abusive home health aides. Yeah, this is certainly a difficult one. His family caught the abuse on home surveillance cameras there, but say complications from his injuries led to their father's death this past June. And now the family, of course, wants to raise awareness on the issue. Narmeen Chaudhary sat down with them earlier today. Uh, Narmeen, this one is a difficult one. Definitely a difficult one to watch, Samson and John. We want to first warn our viewers this video you're about to see is, again, tough to watch. It's uncomfortable, it's infuriating, but should make a lot of people wake up as well. When you leave your loved one at home to be taken care of by a service, what is happening when you're not watching? Sometimes the answer can be very disturbing. I'm not out his final days at his Staten Island home, but it was inside that home where he was allegedly abused, neglected, and harassed by home health aides. Maz's family now trying to raise awareness and going after Visiting Nurse Service of New York and Partners in Care, the very service responsible for supplying, it seems, incompetent aid after aid. Why were there uh, a, a string of aides coming into this home, into the home? with who were not properly caring for Mr. Mazza. He probably felt alone, afraid. Mazza has had nursing care at home for several years, but it wasn't until last year Mazza's children says they noticed their father getting withdrawn and unhappy. In August 2013, they decided to install a home surveillance system. They didn't put the cameras in the home to catch them doing something to their father. They wanted to let them know that they were monitoring the situation. Despite informing every aide hired through Visiting Nurse Service of New York of the camera almost immediately, the family says they caught neglect. Each time, aides were called out, let go, and replaced by the NS. But little did the family know the most gut-wrenching acts were still to come. A nurse by the name of Jacqueline Doe does nothing for several minutes after Maza falls from his wheelchair. Instead of helping him up, she screams at him. I'm not picking you up. I am not picking you up. I'm tired of you. I am so tired of you doing this. After Doe, there was William Foster. Foster was allowed to bring his child to work with him, but then this happened. Not only was Foster caught masturbating with his child and Maza in the room, it seemed Foster could care less of taking care of Maza. As Maza repeatedly asks for help to find his shoes and get up out of bed, Foster instead tosses the frail man like a rag doll. Maza's family says their father suffered not only emotionally, but physically. Several broken ribs and head injuries led to Maza having to live out his final days in a nursing home because he was left unable to swallow. I don't know if my father just gave up the will to live and he was done with his fight, but on Father's Day, I asked my dad to give me the greatest gift he could ever give me and to let go. And he did. And I think it's worth re-mentioning that this abuse caught on camera happened after the aides were notified there was a full surveillance system inside the home. In the meantime, BSN and Partners in Care issued a statement to us saying their requirements and training of caregivers, in fact, exceed those mandated by the state. In Maza's case, they have dismissed Jacqueline Doe, the aide that you saw neglecting Maza's fall. And they continue, they say, to work with the Department of Health on all of the family's concerns. Tamsin and John, I, I think so we're just disturbing. Yeah, I think we're just sitting here shocked if you look at that. What, what are the background checks? That I'm going to play one more clip for you. Uh, this is a follow-up to that story. Yesterday, in this video that is simply hard to watch. It hit home for a lot of people, though. The family of this elderly man here says they trusted a system to take care of him, and they say it failed. Yeah, we first brought you this story yesterday, but today we want to know what are the qualifications and requirements for these aides who we invite into our homes. Are there any? Mix 11's Narmeen Chodhury here now with more details. Narmeen. John Hampton, the family obviously wants some changes. There is absolutely no question about that. As of now, the public access to information 
event. Still clear to work. It is evidence we very rarely even get to see. Alleged neglect and abuse all caught on home surveillance cameras. So those clips, um, while, while disturbing, unfortunately, uh, don't even show the worst of the uh, abuse that was caught uh, on tape. And <clears throat> the uh, following, uh, following the story when it came out, uh, I received probably five or six phone calls from other families who were using uh, that agency and who had AIDS in the home caring for their loved ones through this agency and I've already filed an additional lawsuit on behalf of another family in Brooklyn uh, in fact it's a former district attorney whose father uh, suffered neglect as a result of a partners in care aid and uh, suffered some very significant injuries uh, and unfortunately again is now going to have to live the rest of his life uh, in, in pain. So the reason I wanted you to see these clips is because there are, there's a lot of misinformation and incorrect information out there about what these agencies do in terms of screening, hiring, training, and supervising these aides. Uh, unlike in the uh, world of nursing homes, there are very few, if any, regulations that require the agencies that hire these people uh, to provide them with specific supervision. Um, there are regulations regarding their training, 
But the fact of the matter is that the training uh, is suspect. In fact, uh, what we found is that even though VNS claims to provide the highest level of training and exceeds the state mandated level, many of these aides coming into the homes don't even have the basic skill set to provide some of the basic assistance with activities of daily living. Uh, one example of that is uh, uh, this new case that I filed. Uh, the, the gentleman had specific issues regarding uh, ambulating, walking. And he needed an aide who could assist him in moving from place to place, uh, assistance in using a rolling walker. And these are specific requirements, and you need specific training in order to do that. So while VNS claims to match up the aides with the particular needs of the resident, it's rarely done. And you end up with a bad result. You end up with somebody getting hurt because the aide in the home doesn't know what to do. Uh, even uh, worse is some of the places we're finding they are getting these aides from. Uh, they're getting them from places like Craigslist. Uh, we also have information that they have hired uh, people from homeless shelters to come in, train them, and send them out to live in people's homes. And if you think about it, um, if you're homeless and you have the ability to get a job, even though it's minimum wage, and you can qualify to work on a 24-hour shift in someone's house, well, that's a lot better than being in a homeless shelter. Now. Uh, I'm not saying that that's the norm, but it's happening. And if it happens to one family, it's too many. We also now have instances, people calling us about people uh, stealing money, uh, stealing jewelry, and things of that nature. Uh, okay. And since we are, uh, this program is being recorded, and for the purposes of video uh, viewers, the first video code for this seminar is JD10. I repeat, JD10. So, if you're faced with the situation where you uh, have to hire a home health aide, what are some of the things that you can do to prevent? something like what happened to the Mazza family or some of these other families uh, from happening. You know, how, how do we find uh, compassionate people to care for our elderly? Uh, it's, it's very difficult. How do we know we can trust the people that are coming into our homes? Uh, be, uh, you know, if you go on the VNS website or the Partners in Care website, it's very pretty. They have a nice website. They talk about all the services they provide. Visiting Nurse Service talks about the fact that they've been serving the public for hundreds of a hundred years and it's true that's all true however in this segment of home health aides there is a complete lack of oversight and supervision unlike in a nursing home where the state has to come in on a regular basis and do an unannounced inspection to make sure that the nursing home is complying with the state regulations there is no requirement that that be done with home health aides. So uh, in, in the materials, um, I, I listed eight, eight questions that you should ask if you're going to have to use a home health aide or you're going to have to have one come into your home for a loved one. And by, by no means uh, is this list exhaustive because uh, one of the most important things to realize is that it's not a one-size-fits-all situation. Not every individual has the same requirements. There are some high-functioning individuals who need uh, less care, uh, all the way to Alzheimer's patients who, who need significant amounts of care. So you want to make sure that whomever is being sent to your home is at least trained for the type of services that they're supposed to be providing. Uh, so if we take a look at this list, um, ask them, how are the aides recruited and what are the hiring requirements? I can tell you in the Mazza case, uh, at least one of the aides who came into the Mazza home had never been an aide before. It was her first job. Um, when we started to learn about her training, we knew that she did not have all of the requisite uh, training for what Mr. Mazza needed. And 
Uh, that's your first question. Um, do you, you know, do you, uh, where do you recruit people from? Are you running ads in the paper? Or do you get, do you, I would ask, do you go on Craigslist? Do you, do, you, do you go to homeless shelters? I'd ask the question. I really would. It'd be interesting to see what their response would be. They'll say no. But, uh, screening. Are they doing drug testing, criminal background checks? They should be doing it. Again, there's no law or regulation that requires it, but it's something they should be doing. Are they insured? If something happens, uh, there's an injury, there's a problem, is there insurance? Uh, how do you determine what age can be assigned to a particular client? Again, the issue of matching the age skills with the client's specific needs. And I would ask them about the training program. Uh, what is the training program? Are they all trained in personal scale, uh, care skills? Uh, are they trained on how to properly lift and transfer? You'd be surprised to see how many aides do not know how to transfer from bed to chair, don't know how to toilet a resident, don't know how to provide basic catheter care. Um, are they familiar with turning and positioning a bed-bound uh, client to prevent pressure ulcers? Okay. If you have uh, a client who's got dementia or Alzheimer's disease, and I'm going to talk in a little, in a little bit about, uh, specifically about those types of individuals, because what's happening now, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is that the home health agencies do not want to take on these cases. They don't want to take on and provide home care uh, to patients with dementia or Alzheimer's because they are too difficult, and they would, uh, the system would rather see them go into a, a nursing home, unfortunately. Uh, supervision, and I, I think this is one of the most important uh, things to raise with, with the agency you're, you're using. Uh, do they provide a supervisor to evaluate the care that's being provided? And uh, what you'll see is, you know, the aide will come to the house, you know, when they get to the house, they dial a phone number that's like they're, they're clocking in. Um, when they leave, they'll call a phone number, they'll clock out, and the only way that they're supervised is through phone supervision. Somebody might pick up the phone and say, oh, how's the client doing? Everything okay? Yes. Hang up the phone. That's not supervision. Um, there are agencies that do do random spot checks and will send out a supervisor at 2 in the afternoon unannounced to, to see if, if the aide is doing the right thing to evaluate the condition of, of the person. In the Mazza case, okay, even though they had video that was online, uh, you can't watch video 24 hours a day. So when they would come to the house and they would see that their father was unkempt or his behavior was changing or he was losing weight, that's what tipped them off to a greater problem. It's the same thing here. If you uh, have a client and the, the elderly person seems to not, not be thriving anymore, well, this, there might be a reason for that. Uh, so you want that supervision. Uh, okay. Is the aide trained in CPR and trauma-related care? I, I think this is an essential uh, question to ask. Uh, you may have noticed in the Maza, uh, in the video, and I didn't even show some of the, the most horrific video, uh, you saw that aide after he fell, you know, pulling on him, and dragging him, okay? Uh, he was not, he didn't suffer fractures in that fall. There was a subsequent fall which wasn't really shown on the video where the aide just watched him as he struggled to get to his walker. And he fell backwards, he fractured ribs, he suffered a head injury. That was the injury that pushed him over the cliff, went to the hospital, nursing home, and you know, suffered uh, significantly. These aides need to know what proper protocol is. If there's a fall, you don't you know, pick up somebody's arm and, and start to drag them and pull them up. Uh, so are they, are they trained? So, again, this is a, a basic list. Most of it is common sense, but if you are going to uh, engage the services of a home health care aide, you have to ask these questions. I would say also to add a question, when you're talking about insurance, is about uh, workers' comp insurance. You would think, a lot of times you think the agency's got that covered, and as a... Uh, you know, and very often they do not. So that's another question. You want to make sure you got your workers' comp unemployment insurance for that person covered somewhere because if they have a fall or an accident in, your, in that house, then you have more problems on top of it. There's no question. It's a, it's a, it's a good point. You, you know, I, would, I would give this to my clients. I think this is going to my clients. I absolutely. usually always tell my clients also hide everything valuable in the house or get it out of the house. 
I also, I mean, I warned them straight from the beginning, you know, these are not people, you know, everything, social security cards, any kind of important documents should not be in that house. So, I mean, you really have to, I mean, I think it's, it's wise, you know, as, as the attorney to really be giving them this kind of instruction so that they can protect their, you know, their, their elderly parents and things. Yeah, I mean, some of the stories I hear, um, uh, you know, the family will go out and they'll purchase paper towels. They'll purchase detergent. They'll purchase uh, they'll purchase things that are needed to uh, to, to run the house. And uh, you know, a week will go by. Well, we're out of detergent. Well, I just bought you a fifty-six ounce Tide. How did, how did it? How Well, we used it. Yeah. You know, so they're, they're taking things home. I mean, this is this is what's what's going on. Um, and you know. Again, the underlying theme here for everything I talk about, whether we're talking about the home health care aides, whether I'm talking about nursing homes, whether I'm talking about assisted living facilities, and I'm going to touch on all of it, is the system now is set up more so than ever before where profits are at the top of the list. It's, it's really profits over people. I mean, that's really what's going on at the end of the day. And one, one thing uh, I can tell you that is illustrative of that fact is that you now have uh, hedge funds that are purchasing home health care agencies. Uh, so, I mean, you know, to me, the, the, the profit margins, the profits that are available in these companies are astronomical. So you have everybody jumping into the home health care business now. You have uh, individuals that are going out getting licensed and they're running these these companies out of their kitchen on a cell phone uh, so you know everybody's rushing in it's like it's a gold rush because the the flow of the Medicaid money uh, is there there's a there's a pot of gold there and unfortunately the ones who are suffering from it are your clients uh, the elderly so again as I said when I started I don't have the answers to, to these problems. I have some thoughts about it, and we can, we can talk about that at the end. But that leads me to uh, uh, another point. I, it's not in the materials that, uh, in, the, in the packet, but I did bring an article uh, that uh, was recently published in the New York Times. Uh, and if you don't have it, I have some extra copies up here. Uh, it's called Fighting to Honor a Father's Last Wish to Die at Home. And it was, it's, it's an excellent uh, article for a number of reasons. And it, uh, it highlights and illustrates a, a, a problem that's going to be increasing uh, over, over the, uh, the next, you know, several years. And that is, when, you, when your wish is to die at home, uh, how, can you, how can you accomplish that when your need for care gets greater and greater and greater? And unfortunately, the way the flow of Medicare and Medicaid money is set up now, it's going to become increasingly difficult for families to keep their loved ones at home if they're going to need care, if they're going to need AIDS. Uh, this article, I, I suggest you all, you all read it. Um, it. It talks about why and how the system is trying to get rid of these uh, difficult cases, the home health care agencies not wanting to take on the tough cases, and pushing people to nursing homes. So the, uh, the setup now is that you have this revolving door between home, hospital, and nursing home. And the reason that this is happening is it, it is because it's the most profitable way of doing business. Hospitals want to clear out the bed get them to the nursing home. The nursing home loves to have them for that first 100 days that Medicare is paying for it. Okay, the reimbursement rates are such that it doesn't benefit the companies that are running this, this business, running this industry, to keep them at home. And uh, I'll tell you that the, the, only, the only way you're going to be able to uh, keep your loved one at home if they have to rely on the Medicaid system is to either be a very squeaky wheel uh, or have the funds to uh, hire privately. And I can tell you, for, and this is from personal experience, 
having dealt with this issue for members of my own family, including my father, uh, that you can get 24-hour care at home if you want to fight for it, and depending on who the insurance company is you're dealing with. Um, and again, this is a, another theme. For, for those elderly who don't have uh, family or people to, to speak and advocate on their behalf, they're the ones that are going to go by the wayside. Because whether you're in a nursing home, whether you're at home, if there isn't somebody at the helm, being the captain of the ship, making the phone calls, okay, complaining, then nothing's going to get done. And this article is sort of a testament to that. It's a story of a, a Greek immigrant who came to this country, um, worked hard, and uh, his daughter basically devoted you know, much of her adult life to trying to keep him uh, safe and happy and, and healthy at home. And unfortunately, just like in the, the Mazda case, the, the end result that they uh, fought for uh, didn't happen. Uh, so I suggest you, uh, you take a look at that. Okay. Uh, I, I want to move a little bit into uh, talking about the nursing homes because, as I said earlier, the, the trend now is to try to move the most difficult clients into nursing homes. So if you need 24-hour care, Okay, if, if four hours a day or eight hours a day uh, isn't going to cut it, and you can't demonstrate to the home health care agency, for example, that your, your loved one can manage their own medications, you're not going to get home health aides through Medicaid, through managed Medicaid in the home. Okay, because those aides are not permitted to dispense medication. As I said uh, earlier, they're not nurses, they're not LPNs, they're not RNs. They're not permitted to dispense medication. So if you can't demonstrate that you know, your mother, your father, you know, who might have five or six different medications that they have to take throughout the day, can handle that on their own, they're going to say, sorry, we can't take your case. So what does that mean for the individual who needs help bathing, walking, okay, dressing? They're going to suggest residential care. And I can tell you from uh, having handled uh, these cases since 2007, um, you know, you, you want to avoid that at all costs. There are some good facilities out here. I'm not here to, to bash nursing homes. Uh, there are some good uh, facilities out there. And I think for the most part, the people who work in the nursing homes, and when I say people, I'm talking about the aides, uh, the RNs, I think they try to do their best. But unfortunately, uh, it's a profit-oriented business, whether they are a nonprofit or a for-profit does not matter. The, the, money, the money train and the money trail is, is what drives the bus. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the nursing home regulations in the state of New York. Uh, like I said, these do not apply to home health care agencies. They don't apply to hospitals. They don't apply to assisted living facilities. They have their own set of regulations, and we're going to touch on that. Donna, just I kind of lose track of time all the time. I go off, so just tell me when we need to take a break. And, okay. So, uh, uh, you know, when we, when we think about a nursing home, right, what comes to mind? Right? When I say the word nursing home, Help. abuse, abuse. and well, what do you think about? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word nursing home? Smells. Smells. What else? Come on. Old people. Crowding. How about this? How about place to die? Right? You know, when we try these cases, we do focus groups. And I'll, I'll go in front of a room and I'll, you know, people don't even know I'm a lawyer. People don't even know there's a lawsuit. Because I just want to hear what they think about nursing homes or about a particular event that occurs. And these are the responses that we get. Place to die. Okay. But... Under the regulatory scheme in the state of New York, that's not supposed to be what happens. Nursing homes does not equal loss of dignity. Nursing home residents experience emotion and pain. Uh, you'd be surprised uh, at some of the things we see uh, with, with some of our clients. When care is improved just a, a little bit, you know, if they have someone to come and help them eat as opposed to a tray being put on uh, in front of them. 
uh, the, the changes in their in their emotional and their psychological well well being. So we have uh, the governing law, which is the public health law, section twenty eight hundred one D, which is a state statute, and we also have federal statutes that uh, govern conduct in nursing homes by administration, medical, and by the, the caregivers, the aides, uh, and the nursing assistants. And if you, if you go back into the, and, and look at some of the regulatory, uh, some of the legislative history of the law, uh, it really came out of the, the nursing home abuses in the 70s. Some of you might remember back in the uh, early uh, 70s, there were horrific abuses in nursing homes. Uh, you know, Governor Carey, at that time, spearheaded uh, state legislation. And over time, uh, laws were passed. Uh, back in the early 80s, President Reagan, in his quest to deregulate every industry in the country, from airlines to some of the other ones, uh, you know, wanted to deregulate nursing homes. Uh, he didn't want there to be any federal uh, oversight. Uh, in 1986, that uh, Congress uh, overturned uh, the statutes that had been previously uh, removed, and they passed a, an omnibus act that generated uh, statutes on a federal level. And that's sort of the logic behind the law. It, it's uh, in New York, the laws were designed to have private attorneys take on these types of cases because the government knew that the State Department of Health uh, was not equipped and have the staff to enforce all these rules and regulations. So they drafted what some say is a, a plaintiff-friendly piece of legislation to uh, entice lawyers to take these cases to enforce the regulations. And it really wasn't until the 90s, uh, mid to late 90s, when you started to see these cases be filed. They started down in Florida, uh, California, worked their way to New York, and um, the, the demographics, I think, are, uh, play a big role in why we're, we're seeing so many of them now. Um, and it, th this is the uh, sort of a part of the law. This is the, 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 the one piece of the legislation that I like to talk about because it sort of encompasses what the rest of the regulations are designed to do. And I just want to sort of parse through this regulation uh, briefly. Uh, so it says residential care facilities must provide. You know, they use the word must. Uh, must is not an equivocal word. It doesn't mean we can get close, it's okay. It doesn't mean some of the care. It means they must provide all of the care necessary to enable the resident to attain or maintain the highest practicable physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being. Uh, what that means is if a resident comes in and he's walking, he should continue to walk unless there is some physiological reason why he can no longer walk. Some disease that's affecting his, his body. If a resident comes in without bed sores, they should not develop bed sores unless they can be shown to be clinically unavoidable, which I can tell you is less than 1% of the bed sores. Um, if they come in and they're speaking, they should continue to be able to speak unless they have some sort of event that would prevent them from speaking. And what you find, and some of you may have personal experience with this, resident enters the nursing home and you start to see the decline. And while not all of the decline can be prevented, the law requires that when they come into a nurse, when a person comes into a nursing home, they are assessed by a physician, there's a care plan that is developed specifically for that individual. And that care plan, which delineates all of the services that they're to be provided, must be followed. That's the must in 415.12. So if they don't provide the care that the care plan delineates, and there's an injury uh, as a result of that, they're responsible for it. Uh, but I would say, you know, what do I hear, you know, from nursing homes is that, Oh, well, now you're at custodial care, so you, you can just kiss all of that goodbye at this, that point. With They basically, they won't even feed the person. They're, they're going to try to, you know, give them liquid food and or they're going to try to put in a, you know, a feeding tube. Yeah, well, this that that's, that's an excellent point, Donna, and what that really goes to, and we're, we're going to touch on this, you know, 
the reason that these bad things happen in nursing homes are really all due to one thing, and that's understaffing. Uh, there isn't a nursing home that um, I've been in or sat in, and I've sat in many and been in many, uh, that is properly staffed. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we tried a case uh, in 2010 here in this, uh, well, down the block in the, in a, in a, before Justice Weiss, and it was... Uh, uh, a verdict where I got punitive damages against the the nursing homes, and one of the, one of the thing that we proved in the case, not only did we catch them falsifying records, but we showed that the amount of time for uh, each resident on the floor for care, based on the number of uh, nursing assistants, was less than three minutes per shift. So when you have a, a a nursing home floor with 40 beds and 40, 40 residents on it, uh, most of whom need to be fed, to be washed, to be dressed, to be toileted, to have their feeding tube cleaned, to have a catheter taken care of. And they're each getting three minutes a shift. Well, how can it possibly be that they're getting all of the care that the care plan is impossible? And, and it's unfortunate, and it happens all the time. Uh, mobility, nutrition, medication, therapy, uh, these are all the things they're supposed to uh, be provided with. Uh, understaffing leads to bed sores, falls, chemical restraints, medication errors. We see a lot of this. Uh, we see a lot of uh, now, but we, when we talk about chemical restraints, we're talking about giving a resident uh, who might be a little agitated. Uh, dementia patients uh, get agitated. Uh, residents who have pain get agitated. If they have an injury, they get agitated. So we see instances where they're giving uh, multiple doses of, of drugs like Seroquel and Haldol, which should never be uh, given together. Why? They don't have enough people to deal with, uh, deal with the resident, so they knock them out with drugs. It's illegal to do that. Allocation of resources. Uh, this is something that um, <clears throat> I started uh, doing probably uh, early 2008. Uh, when we started bringing these cases, With the spirit of the law being that the monies that come in, the monies that the, the nursing homes take in, is supposed to be used for patient care such that the regulations can be followed. Uh, we started to look at how the money in the nursing homes was being spent. And if a nursing home is accepting Medicare and Medicaid monies, which most of them are, uh, CMS, which is the Center, care, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, requires, and New York State requires, that they file documents quarterly and annually called cost reports, which are very detailed uh, statements of where the money is being spent. And I can tell you that uh, in some of the cases I've litigated, I have found uh, some what, what we might call uh, uh, very questionable use of funds by some of the uh, owners, administrators of these nursing homes. I'll give you some examples. Uh, we had a case where uh, there's one section of a cost report called related transactions, where the nursing home is required to list the salaries and or dealings monetarily with any re uh, person who's related to an owner. And uh, in more than one case, we saw salaries listed of individuals uh, in excess of you know, seventy five or hundred thousand dollars. And when we would question at that position who these people were, nobody knew. So we had a case where uh, there was a person listed on the relate, related transaction section as getting a salary of a hundred thousand dollars a year. And he had a name. And I was deposing uh, somebody in charge at the nursing home and I said, Well who is this person? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. I think he's our computer uh, expert. I said, well, does he have an office? Does he have a parking spot? Did you ever see him at the Christmas party? Who is he? He didn't exist. You know, what is that? That's a no-show job, right? That's, that's what that is. And there are no-show jobs at some of these nursing homes. So when we talk, and that's fraud. And, uh, you know, so when we talk to the Attorney General about some of our cases, um, we, we point these things out. And it's one of the main reasons why we have understaffing is because the money is not being spent where it's supposed to be spent. Okay. 
Uh, we're going to talk about screening a case. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to that. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the types of injuries and the types of things that do occur in, uh, in the nursing homes and what you can talk to your clients about in, in trying to avoid uh, some of these things. Um, like I said earlier, th there's no replacement for having a family member uh, be captain of the ship, make sure you're there, uh, make sure you visit, make sure the staff knows that you come. It makes a difference. If they know that you're going to show up every day at 2 o'clock or at 5 o'clock for meals or you're going to come in the morning, um, they're going to treat you differently. That's our experience. Uh, the people who don't have family, very sad, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see them. And I've visited many of my clients. Uh, you know, you walk in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and the breakfast tray is still there and the lunch tray is still there. Well, what's going on? Not only have they not eaten, but no one's been in the room to at least see that their, their food is laying there. And, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking. So if, if your loved one does not have somebody, they're at great risk. And what I tell families is, you know, uh, make it a division of labor if you have the people. You know, you, you, know, you can't have one person responsible for everything, okay? Have one person who's responsible for being the, the pain in the butt, who makes the phone calls, who maybe writes letters to the nursing home and makes complaints who goes and speaks to the head nurse every time they go visit or speaks to the floor nurse. What's happening with my dad and my mom today? How are they doing? Was he, was he taken out of bed? Did you walk him down the hall? Did he eat? Can I see the, can I see the form that says what percentage of meals he, he's eaten in the last couple of days? Do that. Okay? Have the other person maybe be responsible you know, for making sure that he's getting his medications. You, know, you, you, you split it up, and that's where we see the, uh, the better result. We're seeing more and more falls in nursing homes now. We're, seeing, uh, we're getting a lot of those cases. Um, again, a lot of it has, again, money. Uh, we have a case now where the equipment in some of these nursing homes, things like shower chairs, uh, wheelchairs. You know, when they have to shower immobile individuals, they have to use shower chairs to wheel them down to, to give them a shower. Uh, we have a case where the, the shower chair in this one facility was so decrepit and old that when they placed the person in the shower, it collapsed, and the person fell and, and broke you know, all but four bones in her body. That should, that should not happen. That, that, to me, rises almost to the level of, of criminal behavior. And what they'll do is, you know, at the, uh, when, when the, the equipment gets old, they'll move it from the, the, the third floor down to the second floor, and it makes it way to the first floor. Uh, so you, you have to watch out for these things. Uh, you know, bed sores are a major, major problem. Uh, they are probably the most preventable of all injuries that occur in nursing homes. Despite what the defense lawyers like to, to say in every one of my cases, they are not unavoidable. Uh, and it is actually rare that a bed sore is unavoidable. Uh, a bed sore is caused simply by, simply by one thing, unrelieved pressure. Uh, Staying in one spot, okay? The, you know, it's very simple. If you take, you know, your, your, your thumb and your forefinger and you pinch the skin between your finger and your thumb, after a while, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to turn white. Why? Because you're creating higher pressure here. The blood's going away. The skin gets no nutrients. The skin dies. That's, as basic as, that's basically what happens. So this notion that because somebody has uh, peripheral vascular disease or cardiovascular disease or cancer, uh, and that's the reason they're getting bed sores. That's not the case. It's unrelieved pressure and improper nutritional support. Improper nutritional, su improper nutritional support is probably as much of a cause of bed sores as not moving them. Because without pro proper protein, without albumin levels that are uh, in the right range, a person's skin is going to break down. And it can be prevented uh, so if you have a loved one in a nursing home where you have clients, tell them, hey, you know, are they in bed every time you go visit them? Take the sheet off. Say, you know what, let me, let me check out your back. You know, mom, dad, let me, you know, let me put some cream on you, make you feel good. Uh, you'd be surprised at what you might find. Okay. Okay, medication. Um, you know, again, we, we see a lot of these medication errors. Uh, the uh, regulations require that all of the medications that are being taken by a resident are listed. 
The dosages have to be listed. The, admin the administration of the, of the medication has to be listed every day. Um, ask to see their chart. Okay, most of the nursing home charts, now a lot of them are going to electronic records, but ask to see it. If you think something's not right, ask to see it. At the very least, they'll know you're interested. Um, okay. Malnutrition, dehydration, uh, another, another big problem. Residents get into the nursing home, you know, they, they lose their, their will sometimes to, to eat. Uh, they don't want to drink. The aides, the, the nursing assistants in the, in the nursing home are supposed to help them. They're supposed, if they're not eating, they're supposed to help them eat. They're not allowed to put a tray on a table and walk out if the person's not eating. If you see this going on, you, know, you tell your clients, make sure they're eating. Make sure they're getting protein supplements if they're not eating. Um, you know, taking advantage of vulnerable people, that's, that's what's happening. I'm going to talk a little bit about litigating a nursing home case. So, we take a quick so you want to take, yeah, and then I'm going to jump into assisted living. Okay, so we'll take a probably a good time to take a break. If you need to yes. use the facilities. Okay. All right, so, so we're back, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about litigating uh, nursing home cases. Any, anybody here litigate a nursing home case? No? Okay. Um, as I said earlier, uh, you know, these cases started to become more prevalent, uh, I, I'd say about uh, you know, 15 years ago. They've increased dramatically over the past five years. Again, a, n a number of reasons for that. Uh, I've, I see a lot of new names coming into the space. Uh, prosecuting these cases. I get a lot of phone calls from lawyers who are a year in asking me to take over their case. Uh, and then sometimes we can't, sometimes we can't. But I will tell you that these cases are uh, not simple cases to, to litigate. There's a number of reasons for that. First thing is they're extremely expensive to litigate. And part of the reason is that the amount of money that you have to spend on medical records is often uh, into the thousands. And having those records reviewed by a competent expert to see if you do have a viable theory of liability, whether you have medical malpractice issues versus statutory violations and public health law, can again uh, run into the thousands. So you might be in for uh, you know, several thousand dollars before you even get to the point where you can decide whether or not you have a case. So in addition to medical records, oftentimes a family will come to you, uh, you know, the injured person may not have had a will. So there is nobody who's uh, officially appointed to be able to represent the estate. So you have to do estate work in the form of an administration proceeding uh, to be able to file the lawsuit. Again, that's something that uh, we do. You know, you're not going to be able to charge for it, but it can, it can often be uh, quite expensive. And one of the things that we like to look for early on, depending on the type of case, for example, in a false case, you know, do we have other cases or do we know of other cases against this facility uh, or problems with that facility uh, similar to the issues that, that's raised in our case? So is it an incident type of situation or a systemic type of situation? Uh, you can go. Uh, uh, there are documents that you can uh, uh, look at to see uh, whether or not a nursing home has been cited for violating nursing home regulations. Uh, there is a, a, a federal book. Uh, we call it the Watermelon Book. It's a big, thick book. It comes out every year, and it lists what uh, the specific uh, types of uh, violations there are, and you can get documentation about the types of citations nursing homes have been uh, cited for by what's called these uh, reviews. Uh, Medicaid will, uh, the state will come in every uh, so often, uh, typically they do it twice a year, and there will be an unannounced visit, they'll, they'll pull charts, and if they see that there's a bed sore, there's a fall, they may cite them for uh, not following the regulations, 
you're not going to get names, you're not going to get dates, but you can, you can see if there's a problem at the nursing home. Uh, and that, that'll tell you why uh, oftentimes the negligence occurred. Again, it's going to be understaffing. It's going to be people who aren't trained. Um, supervision of the staff is another, uh, another big thing. If you went into a nursing home and you just sat, you know, you just went on a floor and sat there and, and just observed for two hours or three hours, uh, what you're going to see is, for the most part, unless there's a problem, unless somebody's ringing the bell, no one's coming by. There aren't enough people on the floor to care for the residents that are there. And it's the competent supervision and the training of the staff uh, that leads to these uh, bad results. Um, I'll talk a little bit, uh, someone had raised this uh, before we started tonight, about whether these cases are medical malpractice cases uh, like you would have in a hospital. You know, if, if someone gets a bed sore in a hospital uh, or falls in the hospital, um, uh, well, we'll leave falls out of it. If someone gets a bed sore or there's a medication error in a hospital, that, that case is going to be considered a medical malpractice case. Violations of the public health law in nursing homes are not, at least in, in my opinion and until the appellate division tells me differently, medical malpractice cases. And uh, this is an issue that is uh, it's a hot hotbed issue right now. Um, there's a lot of motion practice uh, where you have defense attorneys for the nursing home saying, listen, this is medical malpractice. You're claiming that the person got a bed sore. Uh, you're claiming that the medication uh, was incorrect. Well, that's medical treatment. You need to file a notice of med mal. You have to treat it like a medical malpractice case. Uh, we don't look at it that way. Uh, we have a statutory and a regulatory scheme that uh, uh, specifically states and, and provides for regulations that have to be followed in a nursing home. Very similar to the labor law, if you want to make an analogy, uh, Labor Law 240, where you have absolute liability if uh, safety devices aren't provided uh, for a worker on a construction site, unless you can prove that the worker was the cause of the accident, the owner and or general contractor is going to be held uh, strictly liable for the injury. This regula these regulations are very similar to that. Uh, so there's almost like a, a burden shift with these regulations, where in a medical malpractice case, you know, the plaintiff is charged with having to prove a departure from good and accepted medical practice and that those departures caused an injury. With the uh, public health law, it's, the burden is on the nursing home to show, as we saw earlier, that they provided all of the care that's reasonably necessary to, to maintain the highest level of uh, social and, and psychological well-being. So if they can't show that, that there's an injury as a result of a failure to follow those regulations, um, we're going to be able to make our case. So uh, they are very different from medical malpractice cases. Uh, defense uh, bar is, is trying to shift uh, and turn many of these cases into medical malpractice cases to get, a, get away from the statutes. Um, you know, statutes, you violate a statute, it's evidence of negligence, they want to get it out of that world and into the medical malpractice world to make it difficult, more difficult to prove, to make it more expensive to litigate. And that's, that's the fight that's going on right now. So if you're, gonna, if you're going to uh, litigate these cases, you have to be prepared for that. Uh, attorneys, uh, every jury I've picked, um, this comes up. Uh, you know, the resident's old and sick, we can't prevent bed sores, we did the best we can. And, uh, you know, when a, when a defense lawyer gets in the room and, and, and starts talking about all of the, the comorbidities, the illnesses, the problems, uh, I, I view that as a gift uh, to me because most people who are listening to the evidence in these cases uh, know that the nursing homes are understaffed and that they are not providing the care that the residents need. And that is a violation, and, is, and that is an actual violation that can be compensated. So this notion that uh, because somebody's old or sick, they fall or they get bed sores, uh, doesn't work. Okay. Uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Uh, this is a specific New York statute. Uh, it goes beyond the federal statute. The federal statute with respect to bed sores uh, is that a resident who enters a facility, if they have a bed sore, they must be provided with uh, adequate care. 
uh, and it stops there. The New York statute goes a little bit further, and it states that if someone comes in without a pressure ulcer, they should not develop a pressure ulcer, and the facility is responsible for it unless they can prove that they were clinically unavoidable. Again, so there's a burden shift there, right? Now it's on the, on the facility to prove that it's unavoidable as opposed to the plaintiff having to prove that a departure from good practice caused an injury. So it's, uh, it's a very significant dif uh, difference. So the defense uh, bar spends a lot of time trying to show that various illnesses cause pressure ulcers. Uh, and if that doesn't work, uh, they may uh, try to uh, try to show that the uh, bed sores didn't start there, that they started someplace else, or they started at home or in the hospital. Um, but unavoidable bed sores are rare, as I, as I alluded to earlier, and most, if not all, are the result of poor care. I, I, I show this picture only because, uh, not for its shock value, but this, this was a man who, and I'll, I'll take it off because it's not, it's not pretty to look at. Uh, this was a man who was uh, in a nursing home. He was talking. He was, you know, he obviously had a, a hip replacement. You saw the hardware there. And it wasn't until he passed and he got to the uh, funeral parlor where they saw this horrific bedroom. And when I talked here earlier about checking your loved one or telling your clients check their bodies because the, the, the resident, uh, the, the aides may not be doing it. That's why you do it. Okay. Statute of limitations. Unlike in medical malpractice, which is a two and a half year statute, the statute for public health law claim is, is three years, just like you'd have in any uh, negligence case. One thing that's starting to, uh, it, it's already taken hold in other states. Uh, New Jersey specifically, uh, Connecticut to a, to a lesser degree, arbitration agreements. I, I could do a whole seminar on, on arbitration agreements, and, and uh, so I just want to touch on it briefly. But the reason I bring it up is oftentimes your clients may be forced to sign paperwork at the nursing home. Uh, you know, you, you go into a hospital, they hand you the clipboard, right? Sign all these papers. Do you read it? No. You don't even look at it. You don't know what you signed, right? You saw you're responsible for the bill. You're, you're, it's a HIPAA uh, authorization. You know, it's a little bit different in a nursing home. Uh, if you, and we get, we, we see this often, if you have a loved one going into a nursing home and you become financially responsible by signing a document and there's an issue with Medicaid or an issue with payment, they can come after you for the money. We have a number of clients who are being sued and there are two firms that, you know, it's a cottage industry for them suing the families of, of former residents for, for uh, un, unpaid you know, treatment and un, unpaid uh, residency. So be careful about what you sign. Uh, arbitration agreements, uh, yeah, again, is a trend that they're, they're trying to, uh, in the admissions agreement, get families to agree that if there's a dispute, an injury, instead of going to court, you know, we, we go to AAA. Of course, the, the nursing homes and their insurers want that because they don't want these cases in front of juries. They don't want guys like me up in front of juries talking about these cases. So, uh, they, you know, they'd much rather go to an arbitrator who may not award damages. Okay? So, that's very important. Okay. Uh, another important issue uh, with, with these cases. You know, who is the defendant? Uh, there are a number of, of nursing homes who have decided uh, not to uh, have insurance. In New York, there's no requirement that a nursing home have insurance. They can be self-insured. A lot of them are. A lot of them can't get insurance because they have so many claims that you know, they're, they're being dropped. But the, the amount of money that comes into the facility is so great that it, it doesn't make a difference. So they'll operate without insurance. Uh, but as a litigant, you know, that might leave you in a very uh, difficult situation. It may guarantee that you may have to, to go to verdict on a case. Uh, we have several right now. There, there are two or three facilities that we have a, a number of cases against. Uh, you know, they walk into court. We have no insurance. We have no money. What do you want from us?
What's that? Yeah, maybe. Um, so that, that's, that's an issue if you're going to take a case or you're thinking about litigating these cases, uh, solvency insurance uh, issues. Okay. Uh, discovery in these cases is a, you know, it's a true, it, it's a difficult battle. Uh, the nursing homes don't want to provide us with their policies and procedures. If there's a fall or an incident, they try to claim that uh, any of the documentation is protected under the education law. Some of you may know that, uh, you know, quality control type documents at a hospital, for example, if there's a report about, you know, staffing and, and there's a memo about how they're going to staff a certain area differently in a hospital that's protected, we can't get it in discovery. But, uh, you know, the defense firms now use uh, uh, the, the, the education law to try to prevent us from getting incident reports about falls. Uh, so it's, it's tough. Okay, damages in these cases. There are statutory damages uh, in, the, in, in, in the public health law, uh, there, uh, which are, are calculated based on how much the facility is charging. We don't really use that as an element of damages in our case, cases. Uh, it's, it's pain and suffering, conscious pain and suffering, uh, loss of dignity. There was an amendment to the statute that was signed into law by uh, uh, Governor, the guy who came after Spitzer. Patterson, I'm sorry, I couldn't think of his name, uh, that included death as an injury in a nursing home case. Um, separate and distinct from a wrongful death action, uh, we, no one's taken it up to the appellate division yet, uh, so we, we don't know what it, exactly what it means. Uh, we think it means that if you cause a nursing home resident to die uh, due to violations of, of any regulation, that you're liable in damages for that. That's something that we, we're, we're at, at some point, I'm sure, will go up to the appellate division. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to talk a little bit about assisted living facilities. Um, so, oh, but before we do that, I'm going to provide the second uh, video code for the seminar, and that is 23. D as in David, F as in Frank. I'll repeat it one more time. Two, three. D as in David, F as in Frank. Okay. Right. Okay. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, standards of care in assisted living facilities, uh, and then I'll leave some, some time for, for questions. Um, Pursuing a case against an assisted living facility uh, is, is much more difficult uh, than it is uh, in a nursing home. Uh, the statutes and regulations uh, that apply to nursing homes, the specific regulations under the public health law, do not apply uh, to assisted living facilities. They have their own set of regulations. Uh, and they're very uh, general regulations uh, lacking the specificity that the nursing home regulations have. Uh, so the, there are basically three types of assisted living facilities. There's a standard uh, ALF. Uh, there's uh, something called an enhanced assisted living residence. Uh, and then there's a special needs assisted living residence. Uh, the latter two requires uh, special licensing. So you have to be licensed to run that type of facility. And, and basically, uh, when, when you think of assisted living facilities, you, you think of uh, well, for the basic ones, you think of a, you know, a nice sort of hotel, uh, you know, over 65, 75 community with a bunch of a la carte card services that you can, you can purchase. And, you know, if you're high functioning and you can get around and, you know, you're, you're, you're doing fairly well and you can afford it, it's a great, it's a great option. Uh, there are very few uh, Medicaid beds at assisted living facilities, especially here in New York, you're not going to find uh, many of them. They do exist, uh, but uh, there aren't many. So you're going to have to have the money, the money to, uh, to pay for it. Uh, as far as uh, problems we see in the assisted living facilities, uh, and, and before I get to that, I'll just, it's Public Health Law 46B, Article 7 of the Social Services Law, 10 NYCRR 1001, it's in the uh, materials, uh, lists 16 separate regulations uh, for assisted living facilities and the levels of care. 
At one point in the statute, there was specific staffing levels uh, for, for types, different types of uh, facilities, but uh, that regulation was um, removed. So there's no specific staffing regulation uh, anymore. It was taken out in 2009. Again, you know, there's a strong lobby out there. Nursing homes, assisted living facilities have uh, big bucks lobbyists um, who are uh, donate, you know, uh, they're up in <laughs> Albany, they're in Washington, and, you know, they're fighting for as little regulation as they can. Um, and there aren't a lot of people on the other side of that, uh, you know, other side of that fence fighting to keep the regulations. So, uh, you know, it, it's something to be aware of. In New York, we don't, at, in nursing homes, we have no specific staffing regulations. Now we no longer have them in the ALFs. Uh, and if you look at the different types of facilities, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a person who needs specific care, uh, if you need help with medication, if you need help uh, getting from place to place with toileting, uh, you may want to live in or try to qualify for an enhanced assisted living residence. If you're an Alzheimer's patient or you have severe dementia, uh, that's where you might be looking at a special needs assisted living residence. And basically the, the idea is to, uh, you know, age in place, age comfortably, um, live out your life in a, in a nice environment. Uh, each, uh, there's an individual service uh, plan that's got written for every resident under the regulations. It's similar to the care plan in the nursing home. Uh, and it's a contractual agreement between the resident uh, and the facility. And the care uh, that is listed or, or delineated in the contract must be provided. Uh, but the regulations are not as strict. So that bed sore regulation that applies to nursing home that I showed you, that doesn't apply to assisted living facilities, okay? What we see um, with uh, assisted living facilities and where most of the cases uh, come from are situations where a family who really needs the help and has the uh, financial resources will go to a facility, and it's particularly with, with Alzheimer's patients, and I'll, I'll tell you about one case we had. And um, the requirement is that the assisted living facility have a physician do an assessment, and the physician has to uh, pass on the resident. In other words, uh, you know, issue an opinion that the resident is suitable for that facility and the types of services it provides. When you're talking about facilities that are charging, you know, thousands of dollars a month, and you have a physician uh, who's, you know, working in that facility, uh, you know, maybe, you know, they, they, they may, you know, if it's a close call, they may err, err on the side of, of not caution and, and say, yeah, he'll be fine here. And, you know, if you have an Alzheimer's person, uh, uh, patient rather, uh, you better make sure that the place they're going has people trained to take care of Alzheimer's patients because there's a whole host of issues with Alzheimer's patients. Uh, socially, psychologically, uh, behavioral issues. If the staff isn't trained to deal with that, uh, your risk for injury, your risk for a problem goes up uh, tr tremendously. Again, you're talking about, um, you know, profits, right? Profits over people. Um, and a lot of the families are, you know, desperate to, to get the help, so they will sometimes overlook uh, some things that perhaps they should not be overlooking at some of these facilities. Um, okay. Uh, in terms of bringing a case against an assisted living facility, we don't have the public health law. They're basically negligence cases. Um, with respect to that one case, um, give you an example of where uh, an Alzheimer's patient uh, should not have been placed in this particular facility, okay, because they did not have the staff to deal with the behavioral uh, and the cognitive issues. Uh, it was a gentleman, he was, uh, he, he had advanced stages of, of, of Alzheimer's, but he was functioning, he was moving around. Um, he was in a locked unit at uh, an enhanced facility, and uh, on one particular day, you know, cleaning crew came in there, and they're cleaning, and they're using uh, a, a red colored detergent, you know, to, to clean certain surfaces. And uh, that morning they had served cranberry juice for breakfast. You can probably see where this is going. And instead of having, taking, you know, having staff who knew that you don't leave detergent 
you know, or cleaning solutions in the kitchen area in a locked Alzheimer's unit, left it there. The gentleman went in, thought that the, you know, the cleaning agent was, was cranberry juice. Not a good result. Okay, and a, and a painful death. I'm sorry? Yeah, it was, it, yeah, uh, you know, it, it was a horrible, uh, horrible situation. So, again, those questions that we, 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 we listed before about the home health aides, you got to ask similar questions. If you're going to place somebody anywhere, you got to make sure that they have the properly trained staff. You, again, you are relying on them to tell you the truth, but you, know, you have to use your common sense. Okay. I just, you know, we have a few minutes. I, I wanted to sum up, um, uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them. Um, my cards are up here. If you want to shoot me an email, if you have a question about anything, um, you know, I get back to everybody. Uh, follow this Mazda case. Uh, the reason the family brought this case, uh, this is not a case where the, the monetary, uh, you know, award or uh, is going to be great. I mean, this is not why the family wants to do this. They're really out to try to change uh, the system and try to get some regulation. Uh, they don't want to see what happened to their dad happen to everybody else. They fought for years to have him live his life the way he wished, to die at home. They used every penny he had, okay? And the, the one thing, the one thing that they wanted to avoid is what ended up happening. And it's sad. So we're hoping that, uh, I will tell you that I've met with the Attorney General and, and staff members and they know about the case and amazingly when things get on television, so I get the phone calls from the Attorney General. But uh, we're working with them and we hope that uh, you know, together we can make some positive strides and, and hopefully shine uh, a light on, on, a, on a problem that's been in the dark. Okay. If you have a family member and they're going into a nursing home, an assisted living facility, you need a home health aide, you got to be involved. If someone is not involved, your, your chance for a bad result is, is high. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Be, be a pain in the butt, okay? You know, get up there, get to that nurse's station, you see, you know, you see the trays of food. I mean, this is common sense, but the, you'd be surprised at how many families I see, I'll say, well, you know, why don't you make a complaint? People are afraid, you know, they're afraid. A lot of the, the home health aid agencies will tell the families, hey, listen, if you keep complaining, we're out of here. And, they're, and what are they going to do? They have to go to work. Some of the questions I get with the Mazza family, well, why, you know, why did, where were they? Well, they were there. You know, they were working. They put cameras in the house to try to make sure that they could monitor their dad. But, you know, you can't be there 24 hours a day. Everybody's got a job. They have kids. They have responsibilities. Uh, so you got to be involved, share those responsibilities if you can. Um, and uh, just to sort of reiterate, you know, what, what we started with, you know, this change in the, in the flow of money in Medicare and Medicaid, uh, I think is going to bring uh, more of these types of situations uh, until it changes again. The managed Medicaid system, uh, you know, is is profit driven. Uh, you have, you know, five or six large insurance companies in New York that, that uh, uh, are basically providing this care. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the spirit is that they, they want to try to do a good job, but again, it's, it, it's profit driven. And if you have that elderly person who needs that higher level of care, it's going to be difficult to get 24 hour care. So we're going to see more of a shift, people going to the nursing homes. Uh, Staffing levels, I don't see changing uh, at all. I haven't seen any change. So, uh, you know, it's got to be a grassroots thing. Um, uh, write to your congressmen, write to your senators, uh, do what you can. You know, if you have a loved one in a nursing home, each nursing home has an ombudsman, a person who is supposed to uh, hear complaints. Don't be silent. If you see something, say something, okay? Questions? Can you tell us, I mean, I, know, I realize every case is different, but in general, from the, from the time someone comes into your office so you might resolve it, how long does it take? Well, uh, here's the problem with that. Um, you, you know, anyone who litigates in the state courts knows for the past, you know, five or six years, it's been a, just a tremendous slowdown. I mean, number of judges are down, court staff's cut in half. Uh, I can tell you in, the, in Bronx County, where we have a, a significant number of cases from, forget about when they come in my office, how about from note of issue to trial could be three years. Uh, it's a long time. Most of our clients are not, obviously, 
Many of them are deceased by the time we even file the lawsuit. Uh, and there are people who say, well, you know, what are you gaining by filing this lawsuit? You know, what do you, you know, the, the person is no longer alive. Uh, to those people, I say, you know, uh, you know, the spirit of this law is to bring these cases and hopefully the nursing home, you know, if you hit them in the pocketbook, maybe they'll, they'll improve. I'd like to stand up here and say that, that we're doing that. I don't have any facts uh, to prove that nursing homes are any, acting any differently than they did when I first started doing these cases. But it, it does, to answer your question, it's, you know, it's, it's probably, you know, in Queens County, it's probably four years. And I, I guess you know, the range of what kind of recoveries have you seen? Well, uh, you know, when you talk about the, the first question I ask a family when they sit down, um, and again, depending on who you're, you're dealing with, and I didn't really get into screening a case, we didn't really have time for that, but, you know, you ha you know if, if you have an intact family, if it's, you know, a brother and a sister coming in about their mom, it's much easier than a family with, you know, four kids and then maybe, a, you know, four step kids and, and it's all over the place and you have to cite them in order to get an administration. Uh, but in general, we've gotten very good results in terms of the pain and suffering numbers. Um, you know, to give you a range, uh, I, you know, I think most of the bed sore cases, fracture cases, they're all six figure plus cases. Um, and again, you, you, we, there's been very little uh, appellate decisions on damages. We tried a case in 2011, a case called Alvarez. Uh, we tried it up in the Bronx. It was a young man, younger man uh, in a wheelchair, got a bed sore. We tried the case. We got a $750,000 verdict. Uh, insurance company wouldn't pay it offered us the same money they offered us before we went to trial. And uh, we went to the appellate division, and the appellate division, first department, uh, upheld that case. So Alvarez is, was, I think we had the first case that went up. I don't think there's been any since. Uh, punitive damages is a big part of the, the, the claim uh, because they're statutory punitive damages. Uh, they're in the statute. They're not common law punitive damages like you have in MedMail, where basically you have to prove you know, almost an intentional act now. You know, if the, doc the doctor has to testify, yeah, I left the sponge in there, and you know what? I felt like leaving the sponge in there. <laughs> That's pretty much what you have to do to get common law punitive damages, in, in, at least in the second department. So in the public health law, we argue, and there's been some judges who've agreed with us, some ha haven't, all at the trial court level. Uh, it should go to the jury. If the jury finds that the acts that led to the injury were willful, um, then the jury should be allowed to determine whether or not punitive damages should be assessed. Uh, Justice Battaglia in Brooklyn agreed with us in a case we tried a few years ago. Um, we ended up settling it so we didn't, there was no verdict, but uh, this is a big issue now. I get motions for summary judgment trying to dismiss the punitive damages claim in many cases. Uh, we won, we've won a few, we've lost a few. Uh, it's our position that we should, you know, it should go to the jury. Uh, so what we're doing now, we're not alleging it in every single case. We're looking for more of the systemic type cases where we can show a pattern of practice where a judge is going to be more comfortable with the concept of punitive damages, even though I think the statute, and if you look at the legislative history, meant for the punitive damages to be an added element of damages to, to put pressure on the, the nursing homes. But that's you know, my skewed vision of things. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, somebody else had brought that up. You know, uh, I have never brought a case based on financial. Uh, I, 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 we, we do have some cases where part of the claim, uh, particularly with home health aids, are, are thefts of, uh, you know, jewelry and money and, and, and things. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Now, the thing is that I'm hearing a lot of people telling these war stories whereby they have a will, giving it to the three children, one child says, you know, Right. And all of a sudden, there's no estate. And yeah. You know, and then they clear out the money, and then the kids have to try to prove that this is like this yeah. abuse, and they have no money. Yeah, that would be. We don't handle those types of cases. I think that would be more of an estate litigation uh, issue if it's a, if it's among the family members 
and division of, of estate assets. Right. Lou, you got an answer for that one? Uh, <laughs> I have no Go ahead, Lou. No, no, it's not what we do. It just happens every day. There's no broken assets to raise up. There's another question. Somebody, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. There's no question, and uh, you know, it, we we have uh, families who uh, recognize that, and you know, I'll tell families: you treat if you have a, a decent aide, treat them well. You know, make sure you remember their birthday. You know, if they have children, find out their children's birthdays. Give them a little gift. Make them feel like they're part of the family, because in effect, they're a surrogate family member. I mean, they're spending more time with your loved one than you are. So if you do find that, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to find people like that, um, it's important you know, to, to make sure that you, uh, you recognize their good work. And, uh, and just on a, on a personal note, you know, my, my dad went through, we had a bunch of AIDS, and I found, got lucky, you know, we found uh, one who's wonderful, and we do all we can to make sure that she wants to stay. But you're right. If you're fortunate enough to have a geriatric care manager, I mean, so unfortunately, most of the people who suffer, uh, Mazza was an exception. He had a family literally right there, and it was happening. So imagine what happens to these people who don't have the families, you know, who don't have uh, people watching over. Um, so uh, until such time as there's a, you know, some regulations where the home health industry is regulated, uh, and there's, there are some regulations put in place, I just think we're going to see more and more of this. Anybody else? No? Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for your time, and uh, enjoy your weekend. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thanks, everyone, for coming, and uh, you're off the hook. And uh, thank you very much, John, for all. You know, this was a wonderful CLE. Thank you. All right, have a good night, everybody. Uh,